Now, the big story is that Vladimir Putin has reiterated they are having the Eastern Economic Forum in Vladivostok right now. And he reiterated that Donbass, the Donbass region, is the focal point of Russia's military operation and will be from here on out. This comes, of course, as the Kursk offensive uh, has injected a lot of enthusiasm in the Western media and in, including Ukrainian officials. But I wanted to ask you what exactly is happening on the front lines, because there's also data suggesting that in the month of August alone, Russia has gained more territory than at any point since 2022, and that there's a lot of panic around this uh, very strategic city of Pokrovsk, which Russia is approaching. So could you give an outline of what exactly is happening right now on the front line and... Uh, how this speaks to uh, this uh, a panic about uh, Vladimir Putin's seemingly common sense words here. Well, yeah, it's it's common sense. It's an obvious fact, but this is something the collective West needs to distract away from. So this is why they're they're creating some sort of controversy over this non-controversial statement. What has to be remembered is that the the war in Ukraine is a war of attrition. Russia is not trying primarily to seize territory. They're primarily trying to destroy Ukraine's military. They're trying to wear down its manpower, its equipment, exhaust Ukraine's supply of ammunition, something which they are obviously succeeding at doing. Even the Western media admits this. At the same time, Russia is building up its own military power, constantly expanding its pool of trained manpower, its weapons, its equipment, its ammunition, the production of ammunition, uh, they're also trying to grind down Ukrainian defenses. Most of Ukraine's defenses are in the Donbas region. This is this is where this conflict has been ongoing uh, between the separatists and the Ukrainian government from 2014 onward, following America's political capture of Ukraine, crushing these defenses and the the forces manning them. Once you've done that, what is really fundamentally left of Ukraine's military and little or nothing? Once they do that, then they can take as much territory as, as they want or as, as realistically possible. Uh, taking it before this, this is achieved will cost Russia more manpower, more equipment, more ammunition. Uh, so what they're doing is they're pacing themselves. They're, they're not rushing to do this. Uh, they're doing it, and it's going to take as long as it takes. The incursion into Kursk. From the moment it happens, myself, many other analysts pointed out that Ukraine was already overstretched before they launched the incursion. They took some of their best manpower, best equipment, and sent it into Kursk. If you look at the type of territory that Ukraine is now holding in Kursk, it's a very remote region. They talk about holding something like 100 settlements, but when you look on uh, satellite imagery, you can see that a lot of these so-called settlements are a, a single road with three houses on one side and two houses on the other side. So, so th it's a very remote region. Uh, they were able to move into this region specifically because it was underdefended, because there's nothing there. Uh, the only uh, strategic target that they could possibly have been uh, aiming at if there was something strategic they were going after was the Kursk nuclear power plant, but they got nowhere near that. Russian forces have now contained the incursion. It ha has been a very long time since they made any significant progress. And there's no rush to push them out of Kursk because for as long as they're there, Ukraine has to supply all of this manpower, all of this equipment. Men need food, water, ammunition, medical supplies, construction material for their fortifications that they will need to build if they plan on standing, staying there for any long period of time. All of their machines require maintenance, spare parts, oil, fuel. So now they have this, this huge logistical uh, line they need to establish to support these troops in Kursk. We're doing nothing to help the front in Donbas. And as, as myself and many others pointed out, this was only going to accelerate a process that was already well underway. The slow motion collapse of Ukraine's forces and their front lines in the Donbas region, we've, we've seen this accelerate. It was already accelerating, but now the, the pace of acceleration itself 
has begun to speed up. And so this, this is looking very bad for Ukraine. But what people have to remember is that the United States from the very beginning was not, not trying to defeat Russia with Ukraine. They're trying to raise the cost as much as possible while there's still Ukraine left to use as a proxy against Russia. And uh, one last thing, just as a warning to other nations, the U.S. Is, has either politically captured and is using as a proxy or seeks to use as a proxy. This is what the U.S. has in store for them. The, I'm talking about the Philippines or the island province of, of Taiwan. This is what the U.S. will do to these places if they allow it. Uh, and unfortunately, the nature of political capture is you put a client regime into power that does not care about what happens to the administration or country that they're presiding over. So this is all something very important to keep in mind. Um, Danny, your mic, your mic is muted. I'm sorry about that. Yes. Uh, Ukraine is definitely a window into uh, that reality that you just spoke about with regard to the larger geopolitical picture. But Brian, before we get to that, could you talk about the significance of Pokrovsk? Because I'm hearing it a lot in the Western media. There's a lot of fear, also a lot of fear mongering about what Russia is doing to get to this city. But there's also just a lot of fear that uh, this city is on its way to being um, in Russia's control at some point in the near future. However, there's also mixed messaging because you have uh, Sirsky, the head of Ukraine's armed forces, going on CNN talking about how things actually are under control and stable. So what is the reality here? Because on the one hand, you have the Institute for the Study of War, for example, a, a neocon think tank talking about uh, the front line basically collapsing for Ukraine in many areas, or at least a slow rolling collapse. And on the other, you have Ukraine's head of the armed forces saying everything's all right, everything is stable. So what's the reality here and what's the significance of Pokrovsk? Well, well, General Sersky has to say everything is under control, doesn't he? Because if it isn't under control, who is responsible for being out of control? He He's responsible for that. Uh, the reality is, uh, and, and if you have been following this conflict closely, uh, Russia's approach to Bakhmut, for example, the approach is very quick because the defenses between the, the original line of contact and Bakhmut those defenses are relatively light compared to taking Bakhmut itself. The process of taking Bakhmut took many, many months. Um, the, the process of taking Pokrovsk is also going to take months. It's, a, it's an urban area. It has much denser defenses than all of the area leading up to it. So what Sersky is trying to do is he's trying to say, well, look, Russian forces are slowing down. They're slowing down because they're, they're right at the city right now. And it will take them a while to overwhelm the defenses in that city. But inevitably, they, they will take it, just like they, they took uh, Bakhmut and more recently at the IFCA. People have to remember the, the line of contact at the start of this year, 2024, was actually at the IFCA. It was one of the most heavily fortified cities along the line of contact. And now it is held by Russia. Now Russian forces have advanced much further beyond that. If you, you look at the map, you can see how significant the advance has been this year and how much faster things are moving in favor of Russia than they were, say, last year or the year before that. So we have to keep in mind, again, it's a war of attrition. The primary objective of Russia's forces is to grind down Ukrainian forces. That's their primary objective. It's not to take any of these cities as quickly as possible. It is to destroy the Ukrainian forces in these cities. When those forces are depleted, they're going to be forced to withdraw. When they do, then that's when Russia will take the city. It's entirely different than the type of warfare we've seen, uh, say, by the United States and all of the wars of aggression has fought since the end of the Cold War. And this is the problem with Western military analysts. They seem to think that every war is going to be like Desert Storm or like the 2003 invasion or Afghanistan or even the, the intervention in Libya. But, I, but in reality, this is a completely different type of warfare. It is the, the type of warfare Russia has been preparing for for many years. And it's a type of warfare that the United States and its allies are unprepared for and, and will not ever be prepared for because their entire system fundamentally is incapable of preparing for this type of warfare. And just to give one example of this, uh, another thing we will see Ukraine constantly complaining about right now is air defenses. 
And I mean, the, the many times I've come onto your show, Danny, I've talked about how uh, the collective West does not make enough air defenses. They don't make enough of anything, really. The air defenses in particular are extremely expensive, very scarce in the West. They don't have enough. Even before this conflict began, they didn't have enough just to send to Saudi Arabia when they were fighting Ansar Allah in Yemen. So how are they going to have enough to, to combat over 300 Russian missiles every single month, over 4,000 missiles a year? How are they going to uh, defend against that? They cannot. And I was just looking at, because uh, they're getting ready for their, I think it's monthly meeting at Ramstein, Germany, and they're going to roll out all of this uh, military assistance that they're going to be giving to Ukraine. But if you pay attention closely, I was just looking at the UK, they announced 460 air defense missiles they will be sending to Ukraine. Number one, if you read it carefully, these missiles don't exist. They have to be produced. The first batch will not reach Ukraine until the end of the year. It'll probably be a year or two before all 460 are delivered. And uh, when you actually think about the volume of missiles Russia is firing at targets across Ukraine every single month and the fact that you need two interceptors for each incoming missile, that's not going to last more than two months. It's actually less than two months, 460 missiles. But they're, they're not going to get 460 missiles at one time. So it'll be trickling in at a much slower rate than they actually need to use to defend against this. And it's not as if every month or every other month, you, the UK will be able to supply this number of missiles. So this is a this is a huge uh, issue people need to pay attention to. It is unsustainable. There is no way for the West to support Ukraine in a way that Ukraine comes out of this with the advantage. There's just simply no way. All they're doing is trying to drag it out for as long as possible. Hmm. Yes, indeed. It definitely, definitely feels like that, Brian. Now, talk about the, you know, you mentioned air defenses. There was an incident of an F-16 crashing recently amid a missile barrage, amid the fighting. And this has gotten the West actually quite, I think, hesitant to uh, uh, supply what little they do have to Ukraine from here on out. And there's also this question of long range missiles, Brian, you know, this uh, Vladimir Zelensky, the now defunct president of Ukraine, has been asking for this for so long, the permission to not only uh, obtain these long range missiles, but then to use them on Russian territory. And maybe you could talk about the motivations here for ukraine to keep going on like this because the kursk of, of uh, if we want to call it offensive incursion i think is probably more proper that seemed to create a narrative that ukraine was kind of back in the game but what exactly is the reality here given that we still have ukraine also begging for more zelensky begging for more and the results don't seem to be adding up I mean, the, the Kursk incursion was designed almost solely to convince the world that Ukraine is still in this fight. And you would only need to do that if you were not actually still in the fight and you felt the necessity to convince people otherwise. So that's very important to understand. So also, again, I, I want to point out the Kursk incursion has only accelerated all of the various crises Ukraine faces in terms of manpower, ammunition, weapons, uh, in terms of long range strikes into Russia. I'm, I'm just looking at this Guardian article that I, I will cover in my next video on, on Ukraine, which will, I, I think I will publish Sunday. It says Zelensky claims support waning for strikes against Russian occupiers. And they're talking specifically about Crimea. Now, all of this time, Ukraine has been authorized to strike Crimea with Western long range missiles, the Storm Shadow and Scalp air launch cruise missiles, attack them. What does this actually achieve for Ukraine? Absolutely nothing. They're wasting these missiles. They occasionally, they'll have a successful strike where they, they will actually hit an important high value target. The problem is Russia has many more high value targets than Ukraine and the collective West has long range missiles to, to strike at them with. So now you're talking about extending this failed campaign long range strikes against Crimea into the rest of Russia. And I just look at Russia on a map, how vast it is. And even if you don't want to count uh, the Far East, 
uh, of Russia's territory, just the, the western part of Russia and uh, the, the Urals, where a lot of industrial production is taking place, you're going to take a very small number of long-range missiles that, that you have available to you, and you're going to spread it out over a much wider area. So you're already having no success concentrating them in Crimea. Now you want to spread them out across the rest of Russia. It, again, it is fishing for public relation points that will convince people to continue fighting on a little bit longer, which is the entire objective of the U U.S. right now. We've even heard U.S. politicians openly say to the last Ukrainian, and they mean that, and they're going to try to continue this conflict for as long as possible, as long as there's Ukrainians willing to fight and they have weapons to send them, even if it's not, I mean, clearly not enough to win the conflict or even arrive at some sort of stalemate or, or even a semi-beneficial uh, 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 peace agreement for, for Ukraine, they will continue fighting because it's about overextending Russia, raising the cost as high as possible for Russia so that the next conflict, the next crisis the West tries to engineer against Russia, Russia will be that much weaker when trying to respond to it. That's the plan. That's their plan at any rate. Yeah, what's been so interesting, and, and we can uh, maybe close on this point about the battlefield, is that you have uh, this Kursk incursion, which, as you said, Brian, is all about PR and boosting Ukraine's morale. And and at the same time, or at least uh, Ukrainian troops' morale, and at the same time, it seems to have elevated the panic about all of the risks that such an incursion that you've laid out so well uh, really does involve and really does portend. <laughs> because you also have Western media, you have the United States, you have the West all talking about, yes, this there is a lot of reasons to worry about uh, uh, maintaining this kind of operation. So, I, you know, I wanted to ask you, Brian, given all of this, uh, what do you make of the fact that it seems like everything Putin says now it sounds the alarm? It's like a big bombshell development, everything he says about Ukraine, uh, US, whatever it is. And then you have the fact that there, everything that Ukraine is saying, NATO is saying, US is saying, seems to carry like an inherent contradiction. Like Kursk, for example. Kursk was supposed to be uh, both a, a huge morale boost, also a chip for negotiations, uh, right? If you hold onto this territory, you have a chip for negotiations. But then Vladimir Putin and Russia will say, absolutely not. There will be no negotiations. The more you escalate, the less likely we are ever to talk to you. So what do you make of all this? It seems like there's a lot of chaos brewing in this conflict. And I'm wondering what you uh, make of it moving forward. Th those are a lot of good points, Danny, that you just made there um, about negotiations. I mean, I think anyone following this conflict should realize by now that holding even a, a single centimeter of Russian territory, the Russian government is not going to negotiate until that territory returns to them. By the time that territory returns to Russia, Ukraine will be in it's such a much greater disadvantage. I mean, I mean, just look at the whole trajectory of this entire conflict from the moment the U.S. politically captured Kiev in 2014 up until now, how things have progressively gotten worse. The more Ukraine does what Washington tells them to do, the worse things have become for Ukraine. The longer they try to hold out to, to get better terms on Russia, the worse the terms actually become. People should remember that in the very beginning, uh, with the Minsk agreements, well, actually, before they politically captured and deliberately divided the country uh, with an anti-Russian regime in Kiev, they had they had Crimea. Ukraine had Crimea. Uh, Russia only took back Crimea, and, and Crimea joined Russia because of the anti the, the openly and deliberately anti-Russian regime the U.S. put into power there. The Minsk Agreement. Ukraine could have kept all of the Donbas region. Um, minus Crimea at this point, because now we see it's getting progressively worse. But they deliberately strung Russia along, did not uphold the, the terms of the Minsk Agreement. And so they precipitated the special military operation. In the beginning of the special military operation, they took the Donbas region. They had these other regions that they might have been willing to give back 
to Ukraine, if only they negotiated in the very beginning. But the West convinced Ukraine not to negotiate. So now they've lost Kherson and Zaporozhye in addition to the Donbas region and Crimea. So you can see how this is getting progressively worse for Ukraine. Now Russian forces have re-entered Kharkov. They're never going to leave. They're only going to take back more and more and more of Kharkov. And so what, what you see developing is the, the incremental erasure of Ukraine, its absorption by Russia. Remember, Ukraine historically has always been part of Russia. It was part of the Soviet Union. It's, it's independence from Russia is a relatively recent and short-term affair. And so this is what this client regime in Kiev is doing to Ukraine. It is erasing it through its belligerence, through its refusal to recognize reality and to negotiate uh, in, in, on terms that are reflecting the best interests of the Ukrainian people and the Ukrainian nation for whatever it's worth. Uh, so this is a process that will just continue. And the United States obviously underestimated Russia, its military industrial power, obviously. I mean, there are still Western analysts who cannot wrap their mind around how Russia is, is producing more weapons, more ammunition than the collective West. They can't wrap their mind around it. And even while they cannot wrap their mind around that, they're still talking about war with China, whose industrial base is many times greater than even Russia's. So there is a, a huge disconnect between the policymakers in Washington driving all of this. Obviously, the people in Kiev have no connection to reality at all because their decisions aren't actually made by them. It's made in Washington. And the further Washington diverges from reality, the more skewed these policies become and the more catastrophic the consequences are. And we see that playing out every day now in Ukraine. Oh, yes. Yes, indeed. And uh, Ukraine is such a good example of this term that I hear the United States and Western mainstream media use with Kursk. They call it a gambit or a gamble, a risk. But I think what we're actually seeing with Ukraine over the course of this long period now of uh, essentially becoming a, a NATO proxy is that the real gamble is doing that. <laughs> We've seen Ukraine just absolutely destroyed by this. And it seems like that's going to be the path for Ukraine for quite a long time to come. 